Hello everyone, it's Dr. Sam. I'd like to welcome you to my Eye Clarity Podcast. This is a show that offers cutting edge information on how to improve your vision and overall wellness through holistic methods. I so appreciate you spending part of your day with me. If you have questions, you can send them to hello at drsamburn.com. Now to the latest Eye Clarity episode. Hey folks, it's Dr. Sam, and I want to welcome you to another Eye Clarity podcast. So today I had the pleasure of speaking with Nathan Oxenfeld. He is a vision educator, Bates teacher, and so much more. And I was able to go on his show, and I talked about my book, my new book coming out, and some other great topics. So enjoy the show. Hello, this is Nathan Oxenfeld, and today I'm joined by a guest who is an optometrist and also embraces holistic approaches to eye care, and I had the pleasure of being interviewed on his podcast not too long ago called the Eye Clarity Podcast, and I really just enjoy following him on Instagram and seeing the bite-sized clips and conversations with this community. So just really excited to share him with my community today as well and talk about maybe some things from his upcoming release of his new book coming out as well. So thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the show, Dr. Sam Byrne. Good afternoon. Good morning, Nathan. It's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. And maybe before we jump into any particular topics maybe that you cover in your new book, uh, do you want to take some time to introduce yourself and, and share a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. So I am a licensed optometrist, earned my degree from the Pennsylvania College of Optometry in 1984, a long time ago. And it was a very medically oriented education. And I was very interested in vision therapy. Actually, the third year of my, of my optometry school, I got to do an externship with a behavioral optometrist, Bob Sanit, out in San Diego. And it was amazing to see 60 people a week going through vision therapy and the changes that they made in their life. So it, it inspired me to say, that's what I want to do. And so once I graduated, I went to the Gazelle Institute in New Haven, Connecticut and studied child development for a year and opened a practice in Philadelphia, got very busy and sold that and moved out to Santa Fe, New Mexico in the early 1990s. And why Santa Fe? Well, one of the other internships I did was at the Indian Hospital in Santa Fe. And so I knew that Santa Fe was an mm. alternative community that would probably accept a more holistic approach to eye care. And I was right. So I moved here in the early 90s and opened uh, an office and got busy and uh, studied a lot of different alternative things. I would say my philosophy is I, I look at the whole person, not just the eyes. You know, one of the, one of the things is instead of looking at the numbers, you look at the person behind the numbers. And being more in a humanistic yeah. approach, both professionally and personally, uh, fast forward today and, you know, I'm still very passionate about the work and helping people. And, um, you know, I'm just into a more integrative, natural approach to health and that people are making their own choices and what they want to do with their, with their eyes. Yeah, that sounds empowering to, you know, be a facilitator, someone to support people along their journey instead of just making all the decisions for them and <laughs> telling them what's right and what to do. It sounds really nice. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. I, I've, I'm originally from Philadelphia area, um, so that's cool that you 
you started off there as well uh, before going out to New Mexico. Yeah, Philadelphia was pretty conservative. I remember I affiliated with a, an older behavioral optometrist and I could not get any patients for like three months. I mean, I was beating the streets and this was before social media. Finally, I remember I was moonlighting in West Philly at a eye clinic and he called me and said, you got your first patient. <laughs> I was like, whoa, this is, this is monumental. And what I actually did was on City Line Avenue in Philly, there were these hospitals and I went to a few of them and I talked to the physiatrists and I said, I've got this vision rehabilitation type perspective. Can I work with your TBI people? And he said, sure, I never heard of this. And all these people had double vision and balance issues. They were kind of written off by the you know, traditional eye care. So of course, you know, doing syntonics right. and vestibular stuff and yoke know, prisms and all the things, they got better. And then I started working with special needs kids. And so those two communities created a reputation for me that then I started to build my practice indirectly. It was a great lesson because in the end, before I sold my part of the practice, I built up a very uh, busy vision therapy practice in a very allopathic section of the main line in Philadelphia. I mean, it's very challenging. But, you know, that proved to me that you could do this work anywhere. And, uh, you know, New Mexico was, yeah. was easier um, because uh, people were, the, the community was so much more open to it. You know, in Philadelphia, it's more conventional. And I remember even the yoga and meditation, they were in the early phases, you know, back in the late 1980s. Of course, now, you know, yoga is great all over the world. Um, so anyway, Philly was a great um, learning place for me. And, uh, and, I, and I really refined my chops of being able to communicate and talk to people. And, um, you know, I was very grateful to my partner, Dr. Edelman, Dr. Ellis Edelman. He passed away. But I was like an apprentice with him for for five years, and so I, I, I this was back in the '80s, and I remember I met uh, Jacob Lieberman and got involved in syntonics. And I'm really grateful to meet Jacob, and then I got Ellis involved in syntonics, and he actually got on the board, and he was even more excited about it. So we did we did a lot of great things, you know, very innovative, um, way ahead of the curve in Philly, and um, I was really glad to to be there and um, learned a lot. And it's kind of my base for, you know, what I do now, what I draw on with a lot of my content that I put out and people that I, that I help. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you brought up the syntonics because I was going to ask if that was something that you encountered in optometry school or when you were starting to, look more into vision therapy, but sounds like, um, that kind of came in a little bit later. Yeah. So in optometry school, the, uh, pediatric head was a guy named Mitchell Scheiman and he had his, uh, other associate Mike Galloway and they were, um, very conventional, but, you know, I learned a lot about the accommodative convergence model of, of vision ther therapy, but we didn't really go into light. Uh, it was when I got out of school and I think, again, I was traveling, uh, I had met Jacob and we were traveling out in California together and he was speaking at different places. I remember we ended up at Esalen and he was speaking there. And so he was really my introduction to light and color. And then I started to go to the meetings and met Ray Gottlieb and Larry Wallace and some of my contemporaries, Mark Grossman was another person. And so we, we kind of, you know, really took the syntonics model and I loved it. You know, it was just a great way to, yeah. as you know, and of course we've got our, our friend and colleague Gabriel, um, who's in Austria. And she actually spoke at my health summit and she, what she's doing with color and light is just incredible. So a lot of people do in light and color. I've seen some of your content on it and I'm really glad that, you know, people are embracing the therapeutic value of light and color 
because it's pretty, pretty potent stuff. And it's so simple. Yeah. 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 It's, and for, for those who maybe, um, they may not be as familiar with what syntonics is or syntonic optometry. Um, do you want to give a quick little crash course or, or a descriptor of what that is, what syntonics yeah. means? So syntonics comes from the word syntony and it's spelled S Y N T O N Y and it brings bring back into balance. And Harry Riley Spittler was one of the founders of syntonic optometry back in the 1930s. And basically it's using different, looking at different frequencies of light through the eyes. And by doing that, it stimulates the photoreceptors in the retina. And so it can open up your peripheral vision, but it also has some secondary effects because they're non-visual pathways in the eyes where that energy, that color and light can impact the endocrine system, the nervous system, our emotions, our psychological. Um, those of you that believe in the chakras, it can, you know, alter those. So it's, um, it's a modality that, that you can use to help people improve their vision and beyond. I mean, there's so many other benefits, the research coming out on what, what light and color can do for our pH levels, our, you know, our inflammation, our pain. Um, now red light therapy is one of the, the things that I'm looking at as it affects the mitochondria in the retina. And some new studies are showing that, you know, a, a dose of three to four minutes of looking at red light in the morning might actually improve your vision. This is coming from, you know, pretty mainstream science. So anyway, um, the College of Syntonic Optometry, if those of you that want to learn more about it, you could CSO, you could go there, find a practitioner in your area and, um, or, you know, keep following us. And I know Nathan puts out a lot of great info on light. And um, so, yeah, so that's, that's basically. Yeah, isn't their website, um, isn't that CSOvision.org? Yes, that's right. In case people want to. Check it out. Yeah. yeah, it's a great resource. And, um, you know, the books Light Medicine of the Future by Jacob, Take Off Your Glasses and See by Jacob. Um, really good books. Um, again, uh, you know, there's more and more being written about color and light these days. And uh, it's, it's, it's uh, the new medicine. And uh, so I'm, I'm happy to be part of the, the group. Absolutely. Yeah. And just to reiterate, I just love how simple it is by taking in certain colors, looking at them through the eyes can have these systemic effects elsewhere in the whole system. So pretty, pretty amazing stuff. And is that a topic that you incorporate or touch on in your new book? You just brought up Jacob Lieberman's books, um, but I wanted to bring Mm -hmm. our attention back to your book okay. as well um, yeah. it's called vital vital vision is that right? right yep vital vision and it's coming out february 2023 so in this new book actually the way i wrote this book is interesting because i've written five five, five other books but in this book what we did was we did some research on what were the most popular topics on social media and I started off on Facebook and I started to do Facebook Live and, you know, I built up a nice following there. And actually, Facebook went away and now it's coming back. So it's, it's interesting how it goes full circle as I'm putting more attention back on Facebook. But anyway, we did research on all the, the platforms and, you know, the number one question that I got was about floaters. And the second most important question or most popular question was, what do I do with my cataracts? And the third question yeah. was on myopia. Uh, and then astigmatism was like fourth. And then it went from there. A lot of questions about pinhole glasses, a lot of questions about uh, diet, nutrition. So I, I put in color and light in those different topics. Um, you know, it's so much part of my fabric that, you know, I, I can't yeah, not not yeah. talk about it. Um, 
My first book, Creating Your Personal Vision, I actually wrote two chapters on light and color. And um, my book, I Sense, at play in the, uh, the, the field of healing, I actually bring in another energy measurement called the GDV camera. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. This was, uh, this is a camera that was invented by a guy named Konstantin Kordkov, who's a professor oh, yeah. of, of um, yeah, um, energy medicine. And he invented this Curlian type camera. I bought it and I started to do research with energy fields and chakras as it related to syntonics. And when I was teaching at the Esalen Institute, I have a whole group of students that uh, we put through different color and light therapy uh, protocols, and then we'd measure people using their energy fields and chakras. So people like Joe Dispenza and um, Bruce Lipton and Greg Braden, you know, those people are really cutting edge in health and the paradigm around energy medicine. So to be able to see the change in the field or the chakras or the acupuncture meridians through color and light is pretty profound. And in my book, I Sense, I, I talk about the research. This book is more of, this new book is more about what do people want to, what are their questions? And so, right. so I just, we took the transcripts and then I rewrote it uh, put it together, had many people read the book to, to help me, you know, put it together. So it's, it's kind of a compilation of what do people want to hear? You know, what are they most interested in? And it's interesting that floaters was number one, at least in my community. What is it in your community? Do you know? What, what, are, what, are, what are the big questions people are asking you? Because it's probably different. Yeah. Yeah, I you know, there's some similarities and some differences because, yeah, I do see a lot of floaters questions come up, especially recently. Um, it seems like more, more recently compared to in the past. Um, but probably the, the most common question I get more so than like what particular vision condition is more about the time. <laughs> A lot of people just uh, seem to want to know exactly how long it's going to take or what, yeah. what is involved in the process, uh, which I, I can resonate with because I know that I was wondering that myself when I was first looking at this process for my eyes. Um, but yeah, I would say floaters and cataracts mm -hmm. are, are two really common ones. I think the other big common one I get is people who have gotten a laser eye surgery uh, and then lost some of the benefits or the results from that. And mm -hmm. then they're kind of in a pickle because they might, you know, could consider doing another surgery or they want to maybe explore a more natural option. So that that's another one that I, I see a lot in like my YouTube comments and things like that. Mm -hmm. But it's such a good idea to, see what people are talking about, you know, what people want to learn more about and just give yeah. them that and yeah. answer the questions that are actually pertinent. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to create value for my community instead of just talking about myself. You know, that's not going to go anywhere. <laughs> but LASIK surgery, yeah. it's interesting, you know, you bring that up because I did a post on TikTok about six months ago and it was on LASIK and how I do, what do I think of LASIK? And I came out against it. And it went viral, the whole, I mean, it just blew up. And almost all of the comments were against what I was saying. Oh, LASIK has worked great, I'm so happy, blah, 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 where's the science? And there was an article that was written in the New York Times, I don't know if you know this, in 2018, that came out against LASIK surgery. And Morris Waxler, I don't know if you ever heard of him, he used to work for the FDA and um, he was one of the people who approved LASIK surgery. You know this, maybe your community doesn't. So I shared that and it shut people up. They were like, oh my goodness. And it's not that I'm against LASIK surgery. I think you just need to be really informed about what are the side effects. Yeah. And because, you know, if you're a high myo, um, the only way you're going to get there is through LASIK surgery. I mean, at least in my process, 
I cannot help a person who's, you know, over minus four, minus five. How much myopia can they reduce? So in that case, all right, you know, that, that'll get you there. And then you can do your method or my method as a way to integrate what the eyeball prescription has become. But, you know, it's definitely, you know, tricky waters compared to cataract surgery, which is a really safe surgery. And mm -hmm. that one works out really well. Um, you know, the other question I get a lot is monovision, you know, where you're correcting one eye for distance, one eye for reading. And that seems very disastrous for many people, you know, and, they, and, and then they're trying to wear progressive lenses and, you know, gets into all those, those areas. And this is where you and I understand what vision really is. And there's so much of the brain and the body involved and there are ways you can improve it. Um, so you know, we can offer that perspective that I think in the traditional mainstream eye care, they basically just say, well, this is the best we can do. And, you know, you'll, you'll get used to it. Mm -hmm. Something like that. So. Yeah. And I know I was not aware of what mono vision was before I started learning more about vision. And I was, yeah, pretty taken aback by this possibility <laughs> that we can, essentially get one eye to focus near and then the other for focusing far and on the surface it sounds like oh that's a good idea but it when you really think about what that does to the to the brain and and the visual system and how i mean it's amazing that we can adapt to that but kind of like you just hinted at it's like what what do i actually want to get used to what mm -hmm. what do i want my brain to adapt to mm -hmm. um so yeah um Coming, coming back to the, the floaters topic, though, um, since that is a, a popular topic, um, did you want, was there anything in particular that you wanted to um, share around that topic? Well, a few general principles that patience is a really important component if you want to embark on reducing your floaters. And you may need to try some different things, you know, not, there isn't one cookbook approach for everybody. And, you know, people get right. frustrated pretty quickly if, you know, this doesn't work or that doesn't work. But usually floaters, you know, it's been cooking in your eye for a while. It isn't something that just showed up. It's, you know, the vitreous gel in some way has lost its integrity whether it's too watery, whether it's dried out and it's shrinking. There's a collagen issue. There's an inflammation issue. So take your pick. Is it dental care? Is it head trauma? Is it liver issues? Is it just dehydration and, you know, oxidative stress? There's so many factors involved. Uh, so, you know, I think about collagen creation, hydration, giving more nutrients to the eyes, protecting your eyes from, you know, the drying out agents like blue light, uh, looking at your systemic and metabolic health as well. And it's a puzzle, you know, you're in a, you're in a detective type uncovering. Um, you know, I wish, you know, I have these eye drops, MSM drops. And if you look at my patient reviews, some people have reduced it, but that's, you know, I, that's not the magic bullet. It doesn't work for a lot of people. So I'm very conservative about even saying, okay, use these eye drops and they're going to get rid of floaters. The same thing is with laser surgery. I, I have had a number of people who've had the laser surgery for floaters and it's created more problems, more cloudiness, more inflammation, um, on and on. So I think if you've got floaters, I think to start looking at it systemically and metabolically, maybe adding, you know, agents to the eyes that are more natural, natural eye drops, moisturizing, you know, your diet is part of it. And let's see, you know, what you can, you know, what you can do with it. So um, that, that's kind of how I approach it. And I'm not out to make any guarantees or promises that if you do this, it's going to fix that. That's just not the way I roll, but um, you know, that's, yeah, that's yeah. how it is. I mean, uh, do you have anything to add and, to and that? Kick in... Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. But but first, I wanted to mention that I I've taken MSM in the past 
like orally for, I think it was just for like joint health for mm-hmm. my knees or, or something like that. Um, but you're, but you blended it into, an uh, eye drop where it just goes right onto the, into the eye tissue. Yeah. It's a sulfur molecule. It's organic. And, uh, you know, it's in a, a just a, a liquid solution and they're different percentages. Um, and sulfur is the third leading trace mineral found in the body. Sulfur is like sticky fly paper. So it, the toxins will stick to the sulfur and then it can be flushed out. So as a detoxifying agent, one needs to be careful if your detox pathways are not working very well and you start using MSM eye drops, it could create a little bit of irritation, blurriness, redness. Well, that's because your detoxification pathways are overwhelmed. So you have to use less of it or a lesser concentration. And then I get the question, well, I'm allergic to sulfur. And there's a confusion there between sulfur and sulfa drugs or sulfites. So I have to make that distinction as well. And then for for many people, the, the MSM eye drops does help them. It does create more moisture and lubrication. And it's it's a therapeutically driven eye drop that um, seems to to support some people. So, you know, I've used it in my office for many, many years. And then in 2016, when I opened my e-commerce store, I said, all right, I'll put it up and see how it goes. And it really took off. It was, and I have a mist, so you can spray it on the eyelids as well. Uh, but I want to also say it's not the cat's meow. It's not the the magic bullet. And people will write me and say, yeah. can I use MSM for reversing cataracts? Well, no, that's not what that's going to do for you. Uh, you have to do some other things like reduce your sugar and, you know, do some other things like that. So it's, it's one of many things, probably just like you, you have tools in your toolbox and maybe you have some different tools or more tools and it can help people. And so that's the bottom line. And, you know, the MSM is one of many things that, that can be supportive for people. So that's, that's how I see it today. Yeah, and I love that language you used of how it, it acts as that sticky paper and it can yeah. attract the toxins and flush them out. Cause that's sort of the language that I use sometimes around floaters mm-hmm. is, sure. you know, what can we do to flush the floaters out? Sure. And, you know, it's like if we're thinking about physically, dealing with the floaters or, or flushing them out or breaking them up or, or dissolving them in some way. That's one side of it. And, and from the Bates system, I I really love getting people swinging a lot and doing movement practices to really stimulate the lymph Mm -hmm. system, Mm -hmm. uh, to kind of get that cleanup crew involved and, and just get the flow of the fluids going. Yeah. And anybody who has floaters knows that, when you do swing your head or your body or you move, the floaters move as well. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what I did with my floaters. It's like, if I'm just staring and straining, Mm -hmm. they're just like stagnant and stuck in my eye. Mm -hmm. But through the swinging and the movement, it's circulating and potentially sloshing those fluids around and and kind of moving things, shaking it up. Yeah. Uh, But I also appreciated how my, vision teacher, Jerry and Tabor, whenever I asked about my floaters, she would advise me to keep working on my myopia Mm -hmm. because the more my eyesight cleared up Mm -hmm. and I could see better in the distance without my glasses, even Mm -hmm. if there still were floaters in Mm -hmm. my eye, Mm -hmm. I wouldn't even notice them. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, the brain has this ability to like see through them or to tune them out in a sense. So I, I kind of had that twofold approach. It's like, yes, mm-hmm. I physically want these things out of my eyes, but also I want to just keep focusing on my goal here of just getting more and more vision improvement. Yeah. And I think that's a great way to go because, you know, when your vision improves, like you say, with your myopia, then everything changes. And um, I, I would probably say with a lot of people who've had success with floaters, it's partly due to the fact is they're not aware of them anymore. They're still there, but it's not bothering them. Right. And, you know, that's, that's part of the deal as well. And just the fact that you were able to improve your myopia 
well, you, you now have a belief that when people come to you, you, you know it works and you can, you know, you can kind of help people just from your energy, just like, well, I've done it, so you can do it. And, you know, that's what I'm looking for with, um, you know, how I, how I help people is to be able to, you know, all right, am I walking my talk? Am I really, has this really happened? Or is it something I read in the book, you know? And uh, uh, again, um, when we read it in the book, um, it's, it's an idea that's out there, but we're not really embodying it. And what you say about the lymphatic health is so true because uh, for most people, their lymph system is pretty stagnating. I mean, jump on a rebounder a few minutes a day. What does it do to your eye pressure? Well, it might bring it down. It might reduce your floaters. Long swings, which is one of the exercises is on my eye clarity exercise program. I love long swings. It's so great. Uh, so movement, it really helps stimulate um, our our health. And... Um, we're sitting too much, you know, that's kind of part of the issue, right? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's been getting more publicly lately. The other thing I've been experimenting with is supplementing with bromelain. Uh-huh. Uh, the digestive enzyme found in pineapples. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's been some studies suggesting that that can potentially help decrease floaters. Mm -hmm. So I just got a bottle and I'm starting to try it myself because based on what you just said, I don't like to just read about it. I like to have a personal experience with <laughs> yes. it and, and try it out myself. So Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Bromelain is really, uh, I think it works well. I've, I've used it in a number of patients. And uh, so that's, that's something new that's come on the radar, which I think is, is great. So you know, yeah, yeah. and we're always looking for those new things that might, might help. You know, I, I get a lot of questions about scar tissue in the eyes. And oh, yeah. I experimented with natokinase and serapeptase. And in some people, they actually work when they supplement with those. Uh, their uh, eye, eye uh, scar tissue does reduce. And so people with retinal detachments or iridectomies and you know all these surgeries where you're going to get scar tissue um, th this may be a way to to help people be able to see things more clearly so um, I mean, it's very exciting Sorry, what's what's going on sure what were so those things that you so nato natokinase and serapeptase uh, those are two supplements with serapeptase is a digestive enzyme that mm. um, can actually help remove some scarring and eye scarring. There's been some studies, small studies on that. And some people are a little sensitive to that digestive enzyme, so then you could use natokinase instead, which is more of a supplement. And um, mm -hmm. so those, we've been using those for, for the scar tissue that sometimes occurs after a, a, an eye procedure. Mm hmm Sure. Yeah. Cool. And, and you did just also bring up cataracts not too long ago mm -hmm. as kind of a common issue that people run into. Mm -hmm. Um, and you also mentioned how the cataract surgery is, is also an option. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, are there particular things that, um, you have people kind of try out Mm -hmm. uh, before going down the surgery route? Well, if it's an early stage cataract, we try to determine where the cataract is in the lens because based on where the cataract is in the lens, we might use a different treatment. So for example, if somebody has a cataract that's around the edges, that's called a cortical cataract, it looks like spokes, that is related more to a glycation issue where the glycogen... Uh, the glucose molecule has bonded with the protein molecule in the lens, so it creates a cataract that's more based on glucose problems, whether it's diabetes or prediabetes or whatever. So we might use uh, something like carnosine or N-acetylcysteine, or we might use the CAN-C eye drops. 
uh, th those would be some mm -hmm. some things to start with. Now, if the cataract is more in the center, is it in more in the front, the nuclear cataract, which is more of an aging cataract, or the posterior subcapsulary cataract? In those cases, what I have seen that works, again, early stages, is using the Oculamed uh, eye drop, which has glutathione and vitamin C in it. Uh, so glutathione is a big player with lens health for me, and I'll have people supplement with a sublingual liposomal glutathione, boost your vitamin C, get a buffered one to 2,000 milligrams of vitamin C a day. Uh, those, those are, you know, no-brainers. And then if you want to use the topical eye drops, uh, CanSee or Oculomed or the homeopathic Cineraria, certainly you could do those. And you'll know within a month to three months wh whether things are getting worse and, you know, I did a podcast recently on the question I get about cataracts is, you know, 95% of my patients get better with cataracts, but it's that 5%, they start doing these things and their cataracts get worse. And so that was the question. That was the podcast. And this, the cliff notes of that are that maybe the healing is for you to just get the cataract surgery. And, you know, there's some parameters you want to go for. Try to correct both eyes for distance. If you're nearsighted, try not to become farsighted. You know, if you can talk to your doctor right. about staying in that, you know, because nearsighted and farsighted people think differently. They process differently. Yes. Right? And then, you know, do you want to get the multifocal lens? Do you want to get the astigmatism lens? It depends on your lifestyle and... You know, how much do you have? And, you know, there, there are factors involved that I actually walk people to the cataract surgery and inform them. Some of the interocular lenses don't have blue light in them. So you want to make sure if you get the interocular lenses that you're now protecting yourself with blue light, either through, you know, doing some lutein, zeaxanthin and astaxanthin or uh, blue blockers or a screen, you know, just being aware of blue light a little more if you've had cataract surgery. So there, there are things that you can do, but you know, I remember my dad, my dad did my, my program for like 10 years. And then he was in his eighties and he, he was having difficulty driving at night. And so we hooked him up with a surgeon he got cataract surgery. And you know, for the last six years of his life, he died at 89. He was driving at night, he was happy. He was, you know, so um, I recommend cataract surgery. There, there are times then I think it, you know, it, it works better. If you have a mature cataract and these, these things aren't working for you, don't struggle with it. Just go get the surgery. And uh, there's some things you can do preparing before and after. But uh, it's a, it's, they've done so many of them that, you know, chances are you're going to have a really great outcome and move on. That's the healing. Get the surgery, move on. Yeah, that's really important because, um, you know, we, we don't want to get too stuck in, in just one one way of thinking or one approach. And mm -hmm. sometimes I like to remind people um, that allopathic is contained within holistic. You know, holistic isn't just ignoring one part. It's it's sure. taking it all into account. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's good to be realistic and, and know when it's time to incorporate some type of surgery like that into the, the natural healing process as well. I mean, I, I think what's really great about the Bates work is that, you know, somebody goes for cataract surgery and then you can give them a prescription of palming or sunning or long swings or whatever is in your, you know, in your repertoire. It's going to totally help their healing. You know, they're going to, they're going to get their eyesight back in even a better way by doing your exercises, you know? So what a great thing as a physical therapy after the surgery that you can be there for them. And that's what I, cause it's so simple. Oh, palming, okay, that, that's pretty easy. I can do that. I don't need some piece of equipment. <laughs> I'm the equipment. So, you know, I've, I've watched some of your videos and appreciate the simplicity of what you're teaching, but also it's profound. If, pe if people actually do the work, they're going to heal faster. And, uh, you know, with surgery, what a great gift to offer people because they've got anesthesia, they've got antibiotics, they've got steroids, you know, they've got all these things they got to be 
taking. So here you're helping them through circulation, oxygenation, relaxation, you know, more self-awareness. Um, it's a great, it's a great compliment. And that's exactly what you're saying that holistic lives in allopathic and allopathic lives in holistic and they're, they need to be, you know, together. It isn't just we're, we've got this polarity and this polarity that doesn't work. Yeah. Right. So, anyway, right. right. <laughs> so I love and, that. You know, Dr. Bates himself was an eye surgeon. <laughs> you right. Know, performed yes. Eye surgeries. I forgot that. And so he, you know, that was like a one-stop shop, right? You could get your surgery and get your Bates practices from the same guy. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty. It's pretty broad, broad band, you know, in the early 1900s to have a doctor that visionary to be able to be that broad. I mean, I, I kind of wish today some of the surgeons offered that kind of perspective um, instead of this more narrow. So that was one of the things I loved about Dr. Bates was that that broadness that he had. He did it all. Yeah, I'm a very uh, strong supporter of people getting prescriptions that improve their vision. And this is where I sometimes get a little frustrated with the eye care field because they're not willing to help people reduce their prescription. Now there are these online places you can go. I mean, there are ways you can get around it, but wouldn't it be much easier if, you know, Jane says, look, doctor, can I get a prescription that corrects me to 2040? Or can I get, you know, a single vision lens instead of this bifocal? And just the resistance that, you know, this 2020 that we need to have it. Otherwise, you know, it's irresponsible to be seeing through something less than that. You and I know the value of a reduced lens and how it, it impacts people. So um, I, I definitely advocate that, you know, it's why I keep my licenses current. And believe me, I have to take yeah. hours and hours of, courses in pharmaceutical drugs and surgery just to keep my license yeah. current. But it's so important to have that voice out there um, so that I can do that for people because um, I think it's an important component. You know, think about your own case and your own myopia, how you were able to step it down and now you're 2020 and you're, you're doing great. And, you know, that's, that's what's needed in the process. So right on. Celebrate all yeah. of us. Yeah. And, it, and it's so, it, it's almost so common sense because like just quick story. I was on a phone call last week with, uh, there's a group here called the Vermont Small Business Development Center, mm -hmm. kind of helping out entrepreneurs and, and small businesses to grow. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just my first chat with this volunteer who works there and mm -hmm. just trying to get a sense of, of my business and my practice. And I love talking to people who have no idea yeah. about natural vision improvement or yeah. how this world works. So his first question was, are you an optometrist? Yeah. And I said, no, I'm not an optometrist. Um, and then I explained how, what the bait system does can sometimes even help you reduce your prescription over time and, and get mm -hmm. some improvements. And so his question was, Oh, is this something that, you know, your eye doctor would be able to recommend for you? Like, Oh, Hey, you know, you've got this option, you can get these glasses or there's this set of vision therapy practices you can try out and, and we can see how that works. And unfortunately I had to be like, well, no, that's not really the, the way it is right now. <laughs> you, you, probably won't learn about these types of things from your eye doctor. But the fact that just him coming up with that idea and the fact that it was just such a like, oh yeah, shouldn't it be this way? Mm -hmm. uh, like just to a lay person, just really reiterated how the world just needs more and more of this and how on board so many people would be if they just learned that, oh, there's just a a simple set of things I can do that will make mm -hmm. a tangible difference here. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, yeah, M more power to your voice getting out there as yeah. you know a, an optometrist who supports yeah. this this yeah. work and and really continuing to put out you know proof that that this can make a big difference. 
Yeah, I haven't been able to penetrate the eye care community yet. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly penetrated the, the consumer, but not the professional. Yeah. And the other professionals are all in on it, whether they're naturopaths or functional medicine doctors or acupuncturists or massage therapists or whatever. But the penetration into the eye care field with that concept is, um, you know, I'm working on it, but I, I haven't, I haven't done it yet. And and I think social media might be a way to create enough of a uh, a need for it or demand that maybe then, you know, there'll be some change. Uh, sometimes that's how you have to do it through the grassroots. But anyway, I'm so. I was just gonna say that. Yeah, yeah feels like a, a grassroots movement yeah. where it, it's a process of individual people learning about it, mm -hmm. talking about it, and, and essentially demanding it from, mm -hmm. yeah. from their doctors. <laughs> you, know, and, uh, you, you know, it was really funny. Um, when I first opened in Santa Fe and I was reducing all these prescriptions, it was before I was filling the prescriptions, they were going to lens crafters. And lens crafters actually instituted a policy that you could change your lenses, I think within 60 days, um, if you wanted to, if your eyes improved, like, cause they saw all these people where their prescriptions would wow. reduce. And I don't know whether they're still doing it or not, but um, it, was a, it was kind of mind blowing to me that they actually would do something like that. But um, that was that was the only place, and that was the only time. And uh, you know, it's exactly the grassroots is where it's going to uh, have to change. Uh, that's an inspiring story, though, because it's like, yeah, if you can you can influence that, you know, even if it's just one franchise of a larger chain, but mm -hmm. but still, it's like you know, the results are speaking for themselves. Yeah, yeah, they are for sure. But that uh, I, I did also want to just reiterate um, what you said, how it's important for people to find a prescription that supports them and actually leads to improvements. Um, and, and that's just one thing that sometimes if we're only if we're over focused on some of Bates's approaches and writings, uh, I, I'm sure you have encountered, I've encountered as well, people who just don't wear their glasses at all and take that more cold turkey approach. And I definitely experimented with that myself, where I would really test the limits and really go long periods of time without my glasses. But I, I would still put them on when needed, and I would still give my brain that clarity in certain moments and times. Um, so I just wanted to kind of reiterate what you said, and just anybody listening who might feel resistance to putting glasses on, um, it may actually help you progress to the next level, especially if you have the right strength and, and probably like a reduced strength, like you're talking about, Sam. So, Yeah, that's really true. Uh, when I'm counseling people, whether they're farsighted, nearsighted, astigmatism, doesn't matter. It's great to have the step down in between because you're now interacting with more than just total blur. There's some, there's some detail and there's some peripheral. And it's important for your brain to relearn that, that next step of reduction and for you to feel that gradient, oh, this feels more relaxing. And also to be artful about when is the circumstance I wear those. So I'm not going to wear the reduced prescription if I'm driving at night and we're in a rainstorm. I'm going to wear that, say, if I'm hiking in the daytime or I'm you know, playing with my kids or I'm gardening. And then the other, the other side of that, of course, is I have people wear the opposite prescription. Now that's done in a therapeutic setting. Mm. So nearsighted people wear a farsighted prescription. Farsighted people wear a nearsighted prescription. And in a therapeutic setting where there's no visual demand to uh, invite people to start to be aware of mentally what are they thinking when they immediately are confronted with that level of blur gives them a sense of the programming that they're actually doing to their own eyes but it's just kind of under the radar. And so, you know, when you wear a plus lens as a nearsighted person, 
and I'm talking like plus three, plus four for a short period of time, and then you take the lenses off, you're going to start to get more uh, naked visual acuity and same for farsightedness. So I think you can use these lenses very creatively, therapeutically, and to have somebody like you or me counsel them to say, okay, let's do the, the small step down. And then you, these other times you need to go without them, or you can wear the opposite lens prescription. You know, so people start to hook into their awareness about what they're thinking, what they're feeling, how they're moving, how they're reacting with these different lens prescriptions. And that turns their eyes on. They get more conscious in, inside their eyes. And that ultimately will stay with them forever once they make that crossover. And that's why, that's why it works. Um, so, you know, I think we're in agreement there with that. And it's such an important part of reducing refractive error. You know, you have to be able to come down a little bit at a time. And again, the word I use is patience. You know, for most people, they've had these visual conditions. I always say to them, how long have you had them? Oh, 10 years. And you're expecting to change it in, you know, two weeks? Come on, you know, I mean, yeah. you can change a little bit, but give yourself a break, you know, and it will happen, but you need to set the stage so that you're preparing yourself for that opening and it, it you need to be the more patient you are the better it's going to go for you so that's the that's the wisdom around it yeah and and it may may also be the challenge for some people because the the activities themselves you know the different practices and therapies are not difficult in and of themselves but having the patience to stick with it and, and really follow through. Uh, that's a different story. So, um, but I think, yeah, the more you understand how the process works and, and have a couple ideas of, of where you're headed, um, it can really help you stick with it and follow through. Yeah. Yeah. Especially with some help. Yeah, that's it. We're here as stewards and, and guiding, you know, we're kind of, uh, you know, we're, we're taking people on a trip and it's away from the dependency of their, their glasses or contacts or improving their eye health. And, um, you know, I remember when I went through my own vision therapy process, I was pretty nearsighted as well. And my doctor mm -hmm. said to me, I'm giving you one practice and I want you to do it for three months. I was like, what? No, I can't. And basically he said, I want you to use the practice as a mirror to learn about your habits your belief systems, your conditioning. And that was, the, that was the key that unlocked my resistance around, you know, being able to let go of my nearsightedness at the time. I didn't know it, and I went through a lot of resistance around it, but it's less about the exercise and more about what we bring to it. I mean, certainly the exercise is important, but, yeah. you know, it's bringing that insight uh, that, that really is going to, create the change it's not a mechanical thing no oh no yeah and and interestingly i i feel like a lot of people probably at some point come to a similar conclusion of like wow i'm actually even though i want to improve my vision i'm resisting it i'm i'm yeah there's some fear of letting go of the myopia or mm -hmm. the strain or the tension mm -hmm. for some reason. And it mm -hmm. seems very counterintuitive because it's like, well, wait, that's why I'm here doing this. I'm trying mm -hmm. to let go of the nearsightedness, but then there's some deeper thing still holding on. So sure. yeah, I think for, for people to dig deep and really find out what those, mm -hmm. those resistances truly are, um, if we can kind of let those soften up and loosen up and relax, then, the vision can change quite dynamically. Well, maybe that's why these retreats and longer workshops allow people to really embrace those deeper things and feel safe enough to do that. Whereas a, you know, an hour session does something, but when they're on your retreat for several days, wow, now they're getting to see those habits and they're doing it in a field with others common. 
So that's helpful, community, and then the amplification of the community, and then feeling safe enough to go, okay, I can feel my vulnerability around what this really means. And that's why those, those longer retreats are valuable in being able to create the momentum to make the change that you're, you're speaking about. Exactly. Yeah. And kind of goes back to before we started recording, we were talking about, you know, wanting to start, get back into that kind of thing and, mm-hmm. and doing more actual like live in-person mm-hmm. retreats and mm-hmm. overnight stays places. And mm-hmm. cause yeah, it's like before the pandemic, I was, that was a part of my practice that I was mm-hmm. really starting to ramp mm-hmm. up and I was mm-hmm. doing more like weekend retreats mm-hmm. and, and week long kind mm-hmm. of events. And so uh, yeah, it just doesn't really translate with, with the virtual version, uh, to be able to just spend a full day and night, you mm-hmm. know, full weekend and just be so immersed in it. Yeah, exactly. So keep setting those intentions to get yeah. some more of those things on the calendar. Hopefully. Absolutely. Yeah. People are hungry for them. And especially because we've been in such isolation yeah. when, when it's okay for us to, you know, to, to congregate again whoa, watch out. I mean, the level of depth we're going to be in is really powerful. So it's coming, you know, it's definitely moving back into that slowly. So yeah, it's, we're, we're, Uh, we're through, we're through the worst part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, once again, I, I really, um, am not only looking greatly forward to reading your full book, uh, but you also mentioned that you're creating an audio book so that people are yeah. going to be able to listen to it as well. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So we're, I'm in the process of reading it right now and getting the, the audio levels and all that. So we'll, we'll release that through Audible. So I, because I do get a lot of people that say, you know, I'm partially sighted and, you know, I've got a cataract or this or that. Can I, can I listen to the book? And, you know, audio is definitely, that's what podcasts, what we're doing now. You know, people want audio and how can we, how can we reduce the resistance so that people can engage with us? Some people like video, some people like written, some people like audio. Uh, So give it to them in as many different ways as you can. And then people can choose how they want to do it. It's funny, you know, I write a written blog and people love that. You know, and then there are other people that go, I love the video, you know, and then other people go, well, I'm mm-hmm. jogging or I'm walking my dog and I get to listen to a podcast. So it's, it's again, what yeah. the internet has done for us to, to be able to reach more people yeah. in a variety of ways. So, yeah. So that's, that's the audio yeah, part. Everybody's of it. different and, yeah. and requires their own learning style for sure. So. Yeah. But yeah, it's speci- you know, just specifically how ironic it is in order to learn about making your eyes healthier and better requires your using your eyes to read a book. So yes. to to be able to just listen to it, have your eyes closed or palm your eyes or yeah, go on that walk and, mm-hmm. and enjoy it is, is a really nice gift. So mm-hmm. uh, and for it to be in your voice, too, that's, that's yeah. nice as well. Yeah, well, that's the only way I would do it, you know, I just. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to um, express how I really like the title because that that word vitality mm-hmm. is, is a really good descriptor of when it makes me think of Margaret Corbett, who mm-hmm. studied under Dr. Bates and, mm-hmm. and contributed a lot to the natural vision world, how she would talk about when we have this eye strain or mental strain it just zaps the eyes of their vitality. Mm -hmm. And so it just drains them of their energy and their functionality. And so when we can learn ways to let go of the stress and the strain and start to feel more relaxation coming in there, Mm -hmm. not only does that feel relaxing, but it Mm -hmm. actually gets us back in touch with this vital energy that we can now use and utilize. And, mm-hmm. and like you said earlier, when your vision improves, everything changes, everything improves. So yeah, I think it's uh, not only a perfect word, but 
you know, since the title of my book, Give Up Your Glasses for Good, obviously yes. I like alliteration as well. Yes. So you've yeah. got the vital yeah. vision there with the alliteration too. Yeah, so. yeah, that's <laughs> great, yeah. That. Yeah, it's important, you know, the, the rhythm, the, the language of it really plays into it. And when we were, my team and I were, you know, throwing together different uh, ideas and we had so many different ideas. And then this VV, Vital Vision, and it just it just mm. kind of worked. And yeah, vi- vitality, right? You know, we look at somebody and we can tell their health based on the light that's coming out of their eyes. You know, they're bright, they're engaged. You look at a baby, you know, or a puppy. You know, they're so uh, yeah. So I'm really excited about putting it out there and seeing where it goes and what it does. And um, you know, um, you know, thanks for having me on and and. Uh, you know, sharing, sharing with your community and, uh, you know, to be continued <laughs> in our collaborations. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and where, where will people be able to find the book when it is released? Well, we're still trying to figure that out. Uh, you know, obviously it'll be on my website, drsamburn.com. Um, we're probably going to do a pre-sale campaign through our social media, uh, platforms and uh, you know we'll we'll make it available, and I've got a couple of bookstores that I really like, and you know we'll just see. I've got some good distribution channels, so uh, you know hopefully you'll be able to get it uh, in a lot of places. But um, you know just stay in touch with with us, and uh, we'll we'll let you know when we're we're releasing it. Yeah, and you've got plenty of things to to keep people busy in the meantime. Um, would you say that would be the main place you would send people is your, your main website and then maybe, you know, like some social media places mm-hmm. as well? Yeah. So drsamburn.com is a way you can, you can always get me hello at drsamburn.com is a great email. Uh, so I will definitely get, if you have any questions and yeah, Facebook, Dr. Sam Burn or Instagram or I'm on all of them, TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn, um, and my podcast, the iClarity podcast, which is on Apple uh, and Spotify and, and all of that. So a lot of places you can find me and um, uh, happy to help. So I, I answer questions for free and all my content is free. So, um, you know, I don't charge anything. Just type in what you want to learn and my name and something will come up for you that I know will help. So that's, that's kind of it's pretty easy for people. Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, something that I relate to as well. Um, just love educating people and putting putting resources out there for free for people yeah. because it's just a matter of, of people realizing that this exists and then, you know, choosing what to do with it from there. So, yeah, yeah thank you so much for all the amazing knowledge you put out and Thank education you. you share with people oh, right on and uh and yeah this has been awesome to to chat with you today and go through some pretty pretty powerful subjects and topics yeah. and want to thank the listeners once again for tuning in and definitely go check out all the things that dr sam's got going on so thanks again sam okay. for being here okay you're welcome bye-bye Thank you for listening. I hope you learned something from the iClarity podcast show today. If you enjoyed the episode, make sure to subscribe on iTunes or Spotify and leave a review. See you here next time.